Shaw, and I am the proud Carnegie parent of two students. One is a senior, Devin Chada, and I also have a freshman. So I have Carnegie, her name is Kieran, and um, it is really nice to be part of this group as we were talking earlier to share some information. And today we're going to focus on sort of the um, process that children and their parents go through in terms of going through colleges, selecting a college and figuring out which ones to apply for. And we're very lucky today to have with us Ashley Chang. Ashley is an assistant manager at General Academic. And in that role, one of her duties is to assist with college counseling and the various programs that they have. She is also certified through RICE for their college counseling program. And she's also in charge of some of the other various programs at General Academic, including elementary learning. Um, she's in charge of scheduling. She is um, always somebody who answers my emails and texts and phone calls when I need something. So Ashley, thank you so much for being here today. Um, just a little bit of background about her. Ashley grew up in Madison, Mississippi and attended Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi. She majored in history um, and some of her extracurriculars include um, piano performance and doing mock trials, I understand. Um, after graduating, she was a high school teacher in grades nine through 11 for two years. And after that, she joined General Academic. Um, and as part of her presentation today, I'm gonna to let her tell all of you what her process was as well about going for it to a small high school and then ultimately ending up at the college that she was at. So with that, Ashley, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, um, thank you for introducing me. And again, thank you for having me. Um, yes, yeah, so um, as Ms. Shaw mentioned, I am from Mississippi. I um, went to school like 20 or 30 minutes from my, um, from my house. Um, and I picked the school that I went to for a couple of reasons. Millsaps College is a really, really small college in Jackson, Mississippi. My graduating class had something like 150 students. Um, and the high school that I went to had about 90 students. And I really, really enjoyed that small classroom environment that I got, um, the handholding that I got with my teachers and just getting to know um, my mentors really, really well. Um, so I knew I kind of wanted the same thing going into my college experience. Um, I was also having some issue with figuring out what I wanted to study. Um, it was just a very classic um, undecided major going in. So I really liked that with a liberal arts college, you, it's kind of baked in that you take classes across multiple disciplines and you have more time to figure out what you want to study. Um, and I ended up kind of declaring my major um, at the end of my sophomore year, so kind of at the last possible minute. Um, but at that at that time, I was sure and I knew that it was the right major because I had the space to figure it out. Um, I just in a couple of other different reasons, it felt like it was the right fit for me. The vibe was right for me. Um, I also took piano lessons with one of my professors at Millsaps and I got to continue studying with her um, when I was at college. Um, so. So, yeah, just ended up being the right experience all around for a couple of reasons. Um, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. Uh, let's see. Sorry, just a couple of technical difficulties. Okay, can you guys see everything? Yes. Okay, okay, see. just wanted to make sure. Um, all right. Yeah, so just kind of our, um, uh, like what we typically recommend for students with the selection process. Um, and yeah, as Ms. Shaw mentioned, I do work for General Academic, which is a general tutoring company. Um, we offer um, all sorts of different services, test prep, subject prep. Um, some of you at Carnegie may already be working with us and of course, college counseling. Um, so this is kind of what I had planned to go through, um, kind of in the order in which you should probably get everything done. 
time to build a solid college list. Um, really from the very beginning, you should figure out why you're going, like what your intentions are for picking a college. Um, what are you looking to get out of college, both in your college experience um, and in terms of your career? Um, what do you want to major in and how will that major get you to where you want to be in five or 10 years? Um, and then on the other side of things, um, what you want your pitch to be. Um, so what about you as a student is really special? Um, and how can you um, convince the colleges on your list that you're a good fit for them and that you have things to offer to the table that an average student wouldn't? From there, you can start to um, use those qualifiers to research a college list, um, both in terms of college fit and college match, which I'll go into a little more detail in a second, um, and then figure out what your goals are in terms of admissions types. Um, are you looking to build your list um, framing around early decision, early action? Are you just kind of applying um, regular decision? Um, what are your goals on that front? Um, and then, of course, the nitty gritty where to find colleges that are a right uh, that are a good fit for you, of course, through bo both in person and virtual visits um, and then general online resources to kind of help you out. Um, and then, of course, happy to answer any questions about any of the above. Um, so in terms of brainstorming. Um, these are some questions that we really recommend students start thinking about. Um, so, of course, very basic. Why are you looking to attend college? Um, at this point, especially if you're a senior, it really should be more than because mom or dad want you to go to college. You can't really think of anything else that you want to do. There's a very specific reason as to what you why you want to go, there's something that you want to study, um, classes that you want to take, and college and the college experience will help you get there. And then, of course, what makes you stand out, um, what's interesting and special about you, and again, um, how is that important in terms of college admissions, um, in what ways have you thrived in high school, in what ways have you struggled, um, how do you want to continue to grow um, when you arrive on your college campus. How have you been a leader, both inside and outside of the classroom? Um, how do you want to grow, again, in that capacity? And then how have you made an impact in your community? What kind of community do you want to build or be a part of once you're at college? Um, and a community can be really anything. Um, a church community, um, mock trial was kind of my community in college. So how does that manifest for you? Um, and then just an exercise to kind of help you solidify where you are. Um, we really like telling people about this particular sales pitch where you pretend you're stuck in an elevator with um, someone who's deciding your, um, whether or not you get admitted or not. And you have 30 to 60 seconds to convince them um, to admit you and to tell them about the value that you bring to a college campus. Um, there are a couple of different ways you can uh, complete this exercise. You can uh, record yourself talking if you would rather not go through the process of like writing things down on a Google Doc. Um, I personally do not like hearing the sound of my own voice, so I would have gone the Google Doc route, but I know um, people kind of have preferences one way or another, so just pick whatever works the best for you. And then, of course, every 17-year-old's favorite question, um, where you see yourself in five years or in 10 years. Um, and we're not saying, per se, that you need to have a very specific answer for this, um, that you need to know that you'll be in your third year of your PhD program in Seattle, Washington, or something like that. But um, it, to, to build a college list, you really need to at least have a general idea as to what kind of classes you like, um, what direction you're being taken in. Are you more of a STEM person, a liberal arts person? Um, are you leaning towards engineering and you're just trying to figure out maybe exactly what kind? Um, and ultimately you wanna be able to articulate again, what you wanna get out of college why you want to go to a very specific college, why that's on your why that's on your college list, why you're a great candidate for that college, and then your own unique strengths, growth areas, passions, and motivations, um, how you've kind of grown in those areas through high school, and how you want to continue to grow through your college experience. Um, and then from there, you can start building the nitty gritty of your college list. This is just a list of different qualifiers that might help you kind of organize your thoughts. Um, 
and figure out like your preferences and what exactly you might be looking for. Uh, starting off, of course, uh, with the size of your undergraduate body. As I had mentioned, I really, really wanted the small liberal arts college environment. Um, I was pretty shy as a high schooler, so I was pretty afraid of just kind of drowning um, in a big state school environment. Um, but you know, if you're more of a go-getter, if you really want the research opportunities um, of a bigger state school, the networking that a state school will provide, or of course, you know, if, if sports are really important to you and you want that to be a big part of your experience all really good reasons to target a bigger school instead of a smaller school. Um, and then that kind of goes hand in hand with student faculty ratio. So is it really important to you to have smaller classroom sizes, um, to really have it be organic that you get to know your professor? Um, if that's the case, then you know you might wanna go to a liberal arts college like I did. Um, and then public versus private school, of course. Um, the big thing here having to do with cost um, in-state versus out-of-state tuition for public schools and so on. Um, and then distance from home. It's probably something that most students have already visualized at this point. If you want to be, you know, 15 or 20 minutes from your parents, um, an hour or two away, so, you know, you don't have to buy a plane ticket, but you still have some distance and you can foster some sort of independence. Um, or maybe you want to be as far away as possible and you're looking for college to be a grand adventure. Um, and then the weather, I, I do include this on this list because um, on, in face value, it doesn't seem like it would be that important. Um, but just speaking from experience, I'm from Mississippi. I don't think I could have withstood a, a Chicago winter or anything like that at 18. Um, so Andy Peters, um, who uh, works with us at General Academic, used to lead our college counseling program. He went to University of Michigan. Uh, and this is one of the buildings at UMich in the summer. And then this is the same building in the winter. Um, and class was not canceled this day. So, you know, if this is something that you're able to deal with, then of course, by all means, um, include schools that are in colder environments. If not, then maybe keep that in mind when researching schools. Um, and then of course, the nearby community. Um, do you want to live in another big city like Houston, um, live in the middle of nowhere, like a true change of pace, a suburban environment, a college town, um, maybe a school where the school kind of bleeds into the city and there's not really a whole lot of separation. Um, the makeup of the student body, there are definitely all girls schools out there, so something to think about if that's something you'd be interested in. And then of course the rest of these um, kind of in varying importance just based on what you're looking for. Um, but ultimately you wanna identify which of these factors are the most important to you because there's a lot to think about and then expand and narrow down your list based on these criteria. Um, and then from there you wanna eventually land on about 10 colleges, um, more or less of course, based on you as a student. Um, you can't have more, you can't have less, just kind of depending on how sure you are about where you want to go and how selective um, your schools are. I will say, if you're applying to a lot of REACH schools, you probably wanna go for more than 10 colleges, just based on how um, statistically difficult those schools are to get into. Um, and then some more qualifiers of building your college list. Um, a lot of you may already be familiar with these terms at this point, um, but it's really, really important to think about um, the schools on your list in terms of these qualifiers, these three buckets, safety, target, and reach schools. Um, safety schools are schools where you would probably get in without too much trouble. Um, we would say you have roughly a 75% chance or above of admission. Um, and this is a school where, you know, your grades are kind of above average based on the typical student, or if you qualify through automatic admission, for example, if you're top 10% of your class and you're applying to A&M, um, you might consider that school to be a safety school. Um, that being said, you still want to make sure that this school is a school that you could see yourself at. Um, you are including the school on your list because you are actually thinking about attending, not because I told you to include this school on your list or your college counselor, or your mom or whatever. Uh, make sure that you think long and hard um, about this school and that you would still be happy attending um, no matter what. Um, and then target schools are schools where if you compared yourself to the typical freshman, 
um, you would kind of be average, um, like falling in the middle 50% among the typical admitted students um, based on, you know, grades, um, your test scores, and so on and so forth. And then reach schools um, are schools where you have less than, we would say less than 25% chances of admission, um, either because your test scores or your grades not be, might not be exactly where you want them to be, or um, if the school is super, super um, selective, we would say that if a school has a, an admit rate of 15% or below, that's probably a reach school no matter where your grades are at, um, just because there's so much in the air and so much going on with those decisions um, that are beyond your control. Um, but the biggest thing with these three buckets is that you want there to be balance. You don't want there to be nine target schools, one reach school, one safety school. Um, make sure that you have a good amount of schools, generally speaking, across the board. Um, again, if you're applying for more reach schools, then um, totally okay to have, you know, five reach schools, three target and two safety schools or something like that. Just really depends on you as a student. Um, so here's a way to just kind of tell where you might fall as a student um, in these three categories based on the school. Um, so all of you are likely familiar already with College Board, um, you know, through the PSAT and the SAT. Um, you probably already have accounts. So Big Future is a service of College Board, um, and they're really good at providing big picture information about schools across the country. Um, so here's just an example of this for Texas A&M. You can see here that among um, the admitted students, um, their SAT range was 1150 to 1370, um, 1150 being the 25th percentile and 1370 being the 75th percentile. So if your SAT score is at a 1000, for example, you might consider A&M to be a reach school because you're below average. If your test score is in the middle here, you might consider this to be um, a target school. And then if your test score is at 1380 or beyond, you might consider A&M to be a safety school. Um, again, this is, a, this is really general though. It doesn't include your GPA, of course, um, your um, extracurriculars, your essay, any of the other qualifiers that they would be looking at when evaluating your application. So this is just a really quick way to see probably where you might fall um, when looking at um, where it would fall in the buckets of your list. All right. Um, and then, of course, like I had mentioned earlier in the presentation, important to think about colleges in terms of admission types. Um, so what realistically does your timeline look like? How early are you starting? Um, and what, which one of these deadlines are you working with? Um, and of course, automatic admit is very, very important in the state of Texas. Um, pretty much every public state school, actually every single public state, state school in Texas will have an automatic admit policy of some kind. Um, a and and UT, of course, being the really big ones. Um, for a and you need to be in the top 10% of your class. For UT, the top 6% of your class. Um, and then for U, U of H and then pretty much any other Texas school, um, the policies tend to be much more um, flexible. So you can mix and match um, your rank with a GPA or with a test score to get in that way. Um, a couple of different things to keep in mind, though, um, it doesn't take into account which major that you want um, and certain majors um, such as architecture, business and nursing tend to be really, really difficult to get into. And I would not recommend um, trying to apply for automatic admission and getting into a major that you're not really interested in, in the hopes of switching later, because that process tends to be um, difficult and not guaranteed. Um, so just keep that in mind with these state schools. Um, and then various rounds of early deadlines um, starting next month, really, October 15th and November 1st are the two um, big deadlines for early action and early decision. Um, early action deadlines are very flexible, really. If you can swing it, there's no reason not to apply early action. Uh, it just means that you get your application in earlier and you get your decision in earlier. Um, it doesn't really have too much bearing officially in terms of your chances of getting in. I will say though, anecdotally, 
it seems like there's a little bit of a better chance, a little bit if you apply earlier and um, numerically just kind of makes sense to me. There are more spots available if you apply earlier. Um, all that to say, just, just um, try to get your applications in earlier if you can. Um, early decision deadlines are much less flexible. Um, that's the sort of deadline where if you um, gain admission, you have to attend regardless of how much money they give you. Um, so, you know, this is the kind of decision that you need to make with your family because no matter, you know, again, how, no matter how much scholarship they give you, you have to go. Um, and there are two rounds of early decision deadlines with a lot of schools. Um, so you can kind of use that to your advantage with your college list. Um, you could ostensibly apply to Vanderbilt for the first round of early decision in November. Maybe you don't get in, but you know that Tulane is for sure your number two choice on your college list. Then you could get your um, application in for early decision two for Tulane, um, and then maybe gain admission that way. Um, and then rolling admissions are uh, the type of admissions where they accept applications in waves, um, even through the spring semester. Um, this is true particularly of a lot of big state schools, so Ole Miss, um, Penn State, I know as well, they have rolling admissions. Um, all that to say, though, um, the earlier you can get your applications in, the better just, you know, for your sanity um, and just to, to have that peace of mind through your senior year. Um, so just a couple of different resources that we recommend for building your list. Um, of course, nothing beats an in-person visit. Um, so if you can continue to swing that, hopefully a couple of you have already made college visits over the summer. Um, if you can also find a way to um, miss a couple of classes, um, so you can talk to professors and sit in on college classes, get to know students in real time. Um, that is just, I think, more helpful than um, visiting an empty campus. So definitely try to swing that if you can. I know that takes a lot more planning. Of course, there are more virtual visits. Um, and informational sessions now with COVID going on. Um, and then Campus Real is a, a resource that I like to recommend in particular. Um, if any of you, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with TikTok um, and just like get ready with me day in my life videos, I tend to really like those. Um, these kind of remind me of those videos. Um, it's just, you know, a student um, with their iPhone kind of recording themselves. It's very organic, very real, um, just, you know, sitting around in the plaza, going to the cafeteria, sorority house, and so on and so forth. Um, and if you search up a school, um, pretty much any of them will pop up here. Um, so really great if you can't swing an in-person visit. Um, big future, of course, I wanna circle back to that as a resource. Again, um, a service of college board, um, so they have a college search tool that I really, really like. Um, and if you click on plan for college, you'll be able to see it through college search here. Um, but they have a couple of different qualifiers that you can use to narrow things down. Um, because, you know, as we can see here, there are like 4,300 schools out there. Um, really impossible, myself included, to know every single school that's available to us. Um, so this is a great way of figuring out if there are schools that you've never even heard of that might end up being a great option for you. Um, the more qualifiers you put in, the fewer schools that come up for you, as you can imagine. So if I want to put in architecture, maybe that's something I'm interested in studying um, in college. You can see now it, things narrow down to about 244 colleges and say that I'm really only interested in staying in Texas. Um, then you see that you only have nine colleges, which is much more palatable to work with than 4,300. Um, so you can pretty much mix and match this to however you need. Oh, and another thing I want to mention is if you have a college board account, which again, if you're a senior, you should have one. Um, if you put in your test scores, it'll tell you automatically if something's a reach, match, or safety school, which is really helpful as well. Um, and then college scorecard is really helpful too. Um, so this is a service of the Department of Education. Um, and like Big Future, it includes a lot of big picture information, um, admissions rates, um, the test scores of people who are typically admitted and all of that. Um, but the reason I like to talk about this one in particular 
um, it's because it includes information like the average um, salary of someone who graduated from this school. So here's UT Austin, a school that I'm sure a, a good number of you are interested in. Um, and each of these schools will include average annual costs um, and median earnings, not out of college, um, but within 10 years of starting as a freshman. Just because right out of college, there are a lot of outliers. Some students might have been taking a gap year, studying abroad, um, gone to grad school and so on and so forth. Um, but really helpful to see um, just the median earnings of someone who graduated, you know, a couple of years out. Um, you can also um, search up different majors and, um, and figure it out that way. If you search up engineering, for example, and different types of engineering, you'll be able to see the average salaries um, based on careers instead of schools. So definitely recommend this as a resource as well. Um, and then, of course, don't discount uh, web pages for individual colleges, um, freshman profiles, um, degree programs, um, and then Common Data Set is a great resource as well. Um, I have the Common Data Set available here for UT. Um, and pretty much every school, again, will include um, one of these and will publish pretty much the same information. Um, so you can see a lot of really general data. Um, the amount of men and women who are enrolled full-time versus part-time, um, Pell Grants, um, let's see, um, people who applied and people who are admitted. This one's particularly interesting. So the units that they require um, and then the units that they recommend, and we can see that they're not always the same. Um, so you can see that they require two science credits, but they really recommend four. Um, and then you can see here um, what they consider to be important um, when they're evaluating your application. So you can kind of see here too what you might consider to be realistic um, for your college list based on what they consider important. Um, some of them might consider test scores really important. Some of them really don't. You see here that they just consider them, but they're not super, super important. Um, and then they don't consider interviews, alum relations, or level of applicant interest. All right, so that's pretty much everything in regards to building your list. Um, all that to say, we at General Academic can help you with any number of things related to your application. Um, we can help you articulate your interests and dreams. So kind of scaling back to the very, very beginning of this whole process, we can kind of help you figure out um, what you're good at, what you really enjoy, what might be a good career for you. And then from there, we can help you research and expand and narrow down your college list. And of course, hone your overall application strategy um, and every other aspect of the application process we help with too. Letters of recommendation, essays are a big part of what we do, um, supplemental and common app essays, and then of course any other element um, of the application, including test scores, looking for scholarship opportunities, um, keeping your grades up. I did include here um, my own email address, um, and then my colleague Sam, his email address is here as well, and then our office phone number um, if anyone would be interested, and I'd be happy to chat further about how we can help um, you or your student. And of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thanks, Ashley, that was great. I think we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, somebody asked for early action, once a child is offered admission, how soon does he or she have before they have to make the decision to accept or not? That's a great question. So uh, luckily it's not a situation where if you apply early action, you have to give your decision earlier than if you applied regular decision. It's typically still May 1st. Um, so you typically still have all of spring semester to decide whether or not you wanna go to that school. Okay. And then someone else was saying, can you add in, or if you could just give it to us, the link for Campus Real? Oh, yes. Um, like, oh, it's like include it in the chat? Yes. Yeah, I can possible. definitely do that. Okay, great. Yeah. And if anybody else has any other questions, if we could go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, and then Ashley, if you can stick around for just a few more minutes, we have um, actually, uh, Gauri, do we have the other two students here as well? 
Hello. Yeah, I do think I see Cooper. Okay. And um, Cooper, do you know if Arnav has joined as well? Okay, let's give them a couple of minutes. Do we want to continue answering some questions? Sure. Themselves together? Yeah, let's do that. Ashley, so another question that has come in. So everybody, Ashley did put the link to Campus Real in the chat. So feel free to go ahead and take a look at that. Um, okay. This is a really good question. Somebody else is asking for early action. If the student is not accepted to a particular school, do other schools find out about the fact that they were not accepted to that school? Yes, that's a great question. Um, typically not, um, especially for early action. They don't really discuss with one another who was admitted and who was um, rejected. Um, I will say, though, if you apply early decision and you um, kind of go back on that contract and you choose not to go to a school that you're admitted to. There is such a thing as a college blacklist. Um, so definitely don't recommend that. But as far as early action, um, they don't really share that kind of information with one another. Okay. And another question um, for UT and A&M, you said that it is difficult to switch majors. But this person is asking, what about other colleges? And what type of college is what type of college can somebody go to where it is easier to switch majors? And if yes, I can so add to that, which majors are easier to switch in and out of? Yeah, so I like this question because this is um, kind of what decided my college list. Um, so if you are still kind of undecided or you need time to figure out um, what you're studying, liberal arts colleges have the most flexibility in terms of switching majors um, and figuring it out later because it's so baked into the curriculum to take classes across multiple disciplines. Um, I know at the school I went to, even if you were pre-med, you had to take an English class. You had to take two foreign languages, language classes. Um, which you know, might not be your cup of tea, um, but with that kind of flexibility, you have a lot more time to figure out what you wanna study and to switch majors later on. Um, uh, typically state schools have it to where it's the least flexible to switch majors, just kind of across the board. Um, and you, know, you can uh, a lot of the time, but it often adds like a semester or a year um, to your time in school, which of course, you know, if you're studying the right thing is completely worth it, just something to keep in mind, um, of course. Um, and, asking, yeah. Are you taking a look? Okay, that's fine. I was gonna say, what's the right, the next question is what is the right number of colleges on the list of colleges to apply to? Yes. So um, I would say 10 or so schools is a great number of colleges to apply to. Um, if you've kind of known your whole life that you're going to go to three or four schools um, and they're not terribly, terribly selective, then it might make sense for you to apply to fewer schools. Um, on the other side of things, if you're really gunning for an Ivy League school, um, that makes sense to apply for more because they're so selective. Um, but I would say on average, 10 or so schools, more or less, depending on your specific circumstances. Okay. Um, another question, is there a difference um, that it would make towards your acceptance into your top one to two schools if you choose a college counseling service versus, I assume, doing it on your own? Yeah. So um, I would love to say that like we are of the same, you know, wavelength as, you know, people who are reading the applications and that we're in communication and they know that they hired us and they got in. Um, I will say that essays um, in particular are a tremendous part of the application process um, and have gotten more important in recent years um, just because colleges have gotten more selective. Um, more and more people are doing really, really well on the SAT and ACT and are um, in more impressive extracurriculars. So that is a big part of what counseling services help with. Um, and you know, something that we at General Academic among other college counseling services can help students hone in and make sure that your entire application is telling a story. Um, ultimately, you want your application to 
be able to convey the kind of person that you are as a student, what your passions are, what your motivations are, um, and fine tuning your essays is a really important part of that. Um, so I will say that it is very helpful, um, of course, being a biased party. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, let me follow uh, up on that for just a second. Yeah. Um, when can you walk us through what your process is? Say if somebody wanted to come to you, they wanted help with their essay. Um, do they write their essay at your office? Do they bring you uh, a rough draft? Like, what's the ideal process of working with y'all to get the essay where a student may want it to be? Yeah. So this looks very different from student to student, um, just based on how ahead of head they are of things, you know, before they start meeting with us, um, how on top of, you know, uh, assignments they are. We have students who come to us with absolutely nothing, um, in which case we kind of help them with brainstorming and figuring out ideas for them to go ahead and get started. And then we have other students who come in with drafts. Um, ideally, we like to get the draft before we meet with them. So we spend as little time as possible just like sitting and reading while the student is waiting. Um, and then there's a lot of back and forth, giving feedback, um, speaking with the student to figure out where they're at and what they might need to add. Um, and then there's typically multiple rounds of that um, until you get to a final product. Um, stuff like grammar and polishing the wording of the essay, uh, we typically wait until the end um, because you want to make sure that the meat of the essay is really good before you start polishing it. Um, okay. Kind of like not putting a new paint, uh, a new coat of paint onto a car that doesn't work, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so let me, there's a couple of questions. Let me follow up with a question to your answer right there. Um, so this person is asking, among the many college prep services, what makes general academic unique? What are the factors that I should keep in mind in choosing one service versus another? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say the biggest thing with us is that we are very personalized. Um, we really get to know each family one-on-one. -on -one. Here at management, um, I've worked with several families for several years. Um, we really get to know the student. Um, and we really make sure that our tutors in particular are of high caliber. Um, the tutors that we have that work with students for college counseling um, did really well in school, are very, very organized, uh, went to competitive schools in particular, um, and typically have had experience with this before. Uh, we never have anyone work on this cold. So that um, combination of a really personalized process along with really, really um, competitive um, counselors is what makes us stand out um, compared to other counseling services here in Houston. Okay, great. And um, this questioner, this person is asking, uh, what does it mean when a college declares itself as a liberal art school versus a college that leans more towards STEM? Yeah, so liberal art school, and it's such a misleading um, name, and I think in a lot of ways, um, it's not that it's more liberal or that everyone there studies the liberal arts. It has everything to do with how the curriculum is structured. Um, just focusing on building a well-rounded person, I think is the, the general idea um, that you're not there just to study um, or take classes in the field that you want, that you're also there to grow as a scholar across subjects that maybe are not completely relevant to the career that you want to take. Um, and it's a big part of what makes that college experience unique compared to, you know, going to a state school. Okay. All right. Um, if anyone has any more questions, please put it in the chat. Uh, let me see if our college students are here. Um, Arnav, did you join? I did. I just saw somebody come in. I want to make sure Okay. We, I think they were having a little trouble for some reason trying to get into okay. the call. Well, we just, we had another question come in. So Ashley, I put you back on the hot seat. Um, so this is from a freshman parent. So thinking way ahead here, do you have any advice for freshman parents? When should we approach college counselors? Great question. Um, so I would say in terms of starting the the college counseling process in terms of applying for colleges, I would start the spring of your junior year um, because the fall of your senior year is really when things start to ramp up, deadlines come up and so on and so forth. Um, you know, maybe at the latest, like the summer before your senior year, the summer is a great time to do that because you have 
typically more free time as a student to work on things like your essay and your common app than when you start your senior year and, um, you know, just school uh, commitments kind of start popping up. Um, we at General Academic, as well as um, likely, you know, some other companies around Houston. We also have early college counseling programs where we meet with students um, to make sure that every part of your application is looking good. So we advise students on um, good study habits, good extracurriculars, kind of focusing on um, exploring careers. Um, so that is an option that we have here at our company. And I'm happy to talk to you guys more about that if you'd be interested in, in that. Um, but in terms of actually filling out applications and starting that process, I would say spring of junior year or the summer before senior year. Okay. Um, I have a question for you. How important is it to um, visit a college that you're considering? Meaning, obviously, you want to get to know the college, but do they keep track of whether or not you visited prior to applying? So some schools do and some schools don't. Um, some schools in particular really keep track of demonstrated interest. Um, so things like putting yourself on a mailing list, visiting schools, reaching out to um, the admissions office, they do have some sort of system to keep track of that. Um, so some schools do. I know Tulane very randomly in particular cares about that a lot. Um, and if you look up the common data set of each school, demonstrated interest is actually one of the things that the, they keep track of. Um, so just you know, another thing you can keep in mind when um, honing in your application strategy. Um, there's a question here. Uh, do, can you explain what the Common App is? Yes. So the Common App um, is a website where you, as a student, pretty much are submitting most of your applications. Um, it's very streamlined, which is very nice. I know my parents probably filled out physical envelopes and sent them off. Um, but on Common App, you fill out the same general information, um, your name, of course, address, your parents' names, where you went to school, your test scores. Um, and that's also where you can show off your activities list. Um, so your extracurriculars, um, really just where you have the nitty gritty of your application will be on Common App. Okay, so in terms of that then, one follow-up question. Um, how many colleges does the Common App allow you to apply for? That's a great question. Um, I believe it's up to 20 or so. Um, I know this because I have a test Common App account that I play around with and I've tried to add more than 20 and they didn't let me. Okay. So I think it does cap you at about 20. So then if it is 20, um, logically, why wouldn't you just go ahead and apply to all 20? Because I know you said limit it to about 10. Why not just, you know, throw everything in there that you're even remotely thinking about. Yeah, um, I would say just because realistically it's hard to keep track of all of those schools and uh, and keep it in sight as to why you want to go to that particular school. Um, another thing I wanna add is that a lot of schools have supplemental essays and those can really add up. Um, yeah. Some schools will have two to three supplemental essays, for example, so if you're implying to 20 schools and each of them has two supplemental essays, you're writing 40 supplemental essays. So it's kind of at a certain point, um, you know, diminishing returns um, might not be worth it for you as a senior to be juggling all of those responsibilities. Okay. Um, I'm going to, we might have a few more questions. I'm going to hold off for just a minute and bring in our uh, college student who's kind enough to join us. Uh, Arnav. Okay. Let me, little quick little introduction and then you can tell us a little bit more about yourself as well. Um, so Arnav is currently a student at MIT. He is also a Carnegie graduate and he is majoring in computer science, um, if I have that right. And he is here today to also add to what Ashley's been telling us, but give it to us from a recent graduate's perspective as to what his process was um, in terms of picking colleges and deciding which one to apply to and ultimately getting to MIT. Um, I, so Arna, if you can, I, okay, there you go. So um, yeah. tell us a little bit more about yourself real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for introducing me and sorry for being late, but um, yeah, I'm a, a Carnegie graduate, class of 24, uh, MIT 28 now. Um, I'm studying, uh, so EE e e plus CS, electrical engineering plus CS, um, they have a 
kind of a joint major uh, okay. and a minor in finance. Um, and uh, I'm, I've kind of eyed that major, I guess, since uh, probably beginning of senior year, but um, I, in my change, who knows? And uh, yeah, um, I, I, I'm I really passionate about like um, both the technical field, but also like I like the reason I'm in this call is just like I want to make sure that uh, kids at Carnegie have a better um, image of how the college app process actually is and what they really need to uh, get through it in a way that, you know, they'll feel like more determined with that they won't regret. So let me let me start you at the beginning then when you started your search for the right colleges. Um, mm -hmm. what were you looking for? You know, considering what your major is and what you're interested in doing, what were you looking for in a college experience? Uh, my college experience, I, I, I really value, um, communities where like I can, uh, both learn, um, like from the people in the community, like obviously education is, is, uh, important. And I aim for the schools that, that offer like, you know, you know, good level education obviously come from Carnegie that's kind of like a value that a lot of people have but also like it's really important to consider the community that you're going to uh, the community that that college has and whether or not you'll uh, kind of fit in with it um, but I mean you don't have to exactly fit in either you know if you contribute something new which is also important then then um, that's 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 the other part of finding the right community and uh, for me it's like I saw, so I'd say like MIT specifically, um, I'm, I've kind of already like uh, um, achieved that. I've see, I can see some blitzes of achievement with school because, um, you know, I, I know lots of like really smart people. Um, but at the same time, I know that I, I'm really experienced in, or I have my strengths, they have their strengths and I can learn a lot from them. They can learn a lot from me. Um, and then also, also I can just find, you know, people who are like, pretty aligned with me both professionally and socially like like it's it's a really well knit community and the thing is I can find a lot of people at that but like that here um and th don't get me wrong there's probably lots of other schools too but you know I, I really narrowed it down to a short list of schools where I can find that kind of community so if I can ask you I'm not asking which schools you narrowed it down to but how many the number of schools how many um number wise were on your short list uh 12 to 15. Okay. And did you yeah. visit all those schools? I've, I visited around like uh, eight to 10 or okay. yeah, around that. Um, and it was like pretty easy. Cause like, uh, many were, many happened to be in like same geographical area. So like one summer I went to Northeast, one summer I went to California and like, uh, like I learned a lot from both. So, yeah. Okay. Um, in, now that you've been there, do you think that the factors that you use to pick MIT sort of lined up with what you're experiencing now? Uh, uh, could, could you repeat that? So you yeah. kind of now, now that you've been there for several weeks, um, mm -hmm. do you think that whatever factors you used in determining that MIT was the right place for you, do they, have they lined up with reality now? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, before, like when I was eyeing MIT, there was definitely clubs that I wanted to join, and obviously the people I saw. There was like groups of people that I could see me like really like fitting fitting in with, and um, coming like now I've been here, I've, I'm still getting acquainted, but for the most part, I've seen it's pretty true. At the same time, there's a lot I have to get through, right? Because I'm still only a freshman, and there's a lot more I have to learn. But I mean, so far it's been pretty uh, pretty uh consistent okay okay um i'm gonna ask everybody to put any other questions that they might have um for arnav in the chat to be um so question here what made your application unique first of all congratulations to you um what made your application unique and um how did and how much other than the community that you mentioned uh, did CVS, uh, CVHS, excuse me, help you to have a good application? Yeah, good question. So um, a lot of what made my application unique is just taking the uh, extra step forward to like follow through with um, 
like the various activities that I've done. So I would say like my, my uh, app was like mainly composed of like, um, let's say, so I competitive math and CS as one angle, then robotics and then research. Um, and uh, overall, like I, I placed an emphasis on community service as well. But I think all of these uh, things are, they're, they're, they're definitely like meritable activities, but it's also really important that in these activities, you have uh, people that you can consult, people who you can uh, talk to um, and, and people who you can learn from. And, you know, having a mentor is very important. And so I was, I was lucky enough to know, you know, people who were aligned with me in the same extracurricular activities that I pursued forward. Oh, and this is a bit, by the way, I'm talking about extracurricular activities, which is like very important in addition to grades. Um, but in, in essence, like having a mentor is, is, is just good in general for life and, uh, you know, um, helping you achieve what you want. And, um, I will say, so, so actually me and a couple of friends are running a little, uh, um, a college consulting thing called summit, um, and, uh, summit tutors, um, where we can definitely help you, uh, um, we get these mentors and communicate with like-minded people. Um, but in essence, you want to find people that, that, uh, you, that are like good to learn from. So for example, when, when it's research, um, you want to definitely, definitely, you, uh, find professors that you can do research with, that you can learn from, that you can talk to. Um, and you want to find, you want to manage to at least get a couple of contacts in there, um, and then find other kids who are interested in, uh, so, you know, so activities. When you, when you say you had a mentor, was it somebody at Carnegie or was it a mentor outside of Carnegie? When I say mentor, so mentor is also a loose term. My mentors were more like, uh, students, older students, students who are still in high school. Um, and then, and then, uh, maybe college, sorry, college students, people beyond college as well. Um, and then of course I had my teachers and also out of school teachers that, you know, I'd, I'd uh, had over the years. Um, okay. and, uh, I'd, I'd say I learned a lot from, from, uh, them, um, because, uh, or yeah, I'm sorry. Um, it's just, yeah, I, I had like a wide variety, but like the point is like, um, mentors aren't something you have to, uh, necessarily make like financial, uh, you know, to, or like spend financially for you just, you just have to find someone who's in your network, who you think, um, you think can provide value to you. And, and if, if, if you think there's not anyone there, I mean, definitely reach out, like, we're in the internet, right? There's a lot, there's, you could join discord servers, join email lists, join school clubs are also really good. And I mean, I know, I know the kids at Carnegie right now are, there's definitely lots of driven kids now, um, uh, driven in research, math, uh, um, model UN debate, all that. Um, and, uh, it's, it's really just about, you know, if you really there's, want it. So it sounds like what you're saying is there's, there's lots of communities out there. And it's a matter of getting involved and, and reaching out and asking questions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That's, and, so, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I just want to add, like, uh, as, uh, you want to, like, you got to drive yourself to, like, you got you to gotta motivate yourself. You have to ask these questions. You have to really want what you want. It, even if it's not something you really, like, align yourself with or something, if you want, if you want it, then you, you should, uh, you, sh you definitely have to figure out um, what, what you what you need to do to get access to, uh, to, uh, what, um, to what you want in the end. Okay. Very good advice. Good advice right there. Um, another question, how did you balance the risk of applying to a low acceptance school like MIT? And how did you balance the schools that you applied to? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, MIT is like, infamously low acceptance rate um and and uh i want to say i got lucky as well but um basically you want to have your safeties right a and m ut ut is very good by the way like the, 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 don't get me wrong ut is i would call it ivy level to be honest but but ut is uh, you want your good safeties um and then um you also have to have a good balance of uh um reach schools like a uh, low reach schools that you think you probably have a like a 40 50% chance total of getting into one of them um and uh i think uh i i had enough schools where i was reasonably confident on that note 
And then after that, I was just comfortable with like going for the rest of the crazy higher reach schools, putting in my best shot into the, for, for them. And uh, um, <clears throat> overall, just, I, I found some success with MIT, but um, okay, I, I was comfortable with my safeties. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, hang tight. I'm going to switch over to Ashley real quick. Um, Ashley, two questions for you. Do the essay questions change um, for the schools from year to year? And number two, what are some of the good safety schools in Texas? So um, as far as the essays, the Common App essays don't really change much from year to year. I think there was one prompt that was added like five or six years ago, but other than that, they haven't really changed very much. Um, the most movement I've seen over the years is with the Texas schools. Um, as far as 2022 and before that, you had to apply through Apply Texas and they had their own special essay prompt that wasn't part of Common App. Um, a and M actually, I want to point out, still uses that prompt, um, but you can apply through the Common App, thankfully. Um, and UT, as of this year, switched to the Common App prompts and not the Apply Texas prompt. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, with those exceptions, they pretty much stay the same. Um, as far as the safety schools in Texas, um, I would say honestly, just go ahead and start looking at the automatic admit policies with every single um, public Texas school. Um, and a and and UT, of course, are everyone's favorites, um, but there are a lot, like dozens of schools really that have um, pretty good qualifiers. And I would say a decent amount of students probably would fit the bill. So I would say start with that and see where, um, you know, you might fall among those public schools. Okay. And then um, it says to kind of follow up on what you had said before, when you said um, kind of start thinking about this spring of your junior year, so the this person is asking what actually needs to get done. What do you start doing spring of junior year? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Common App actually does not open up until August 1st, um, but still really, really important to start before that. So um, that's when you should start working on your essays, your big sort of vision and what you want to uh, shine in your applications, um, what extracurriculars are a pivotal part of you as a person and what you want to continue working on in college. Um, definitely start thinking about big picture things before August 1st. Okay. And let me actually ask Arna the same question. When did you sort of start putting together your list of colleges, uh, reaching out to people to be references, working on your essay? Like what was sort of your time frame to get it all done in time? So thankfully Carnegie uh, had us start to focus on this stuff earlier on. Um, so college list, I was like, I guess ready for April or May. Uh, of junior year um april may junior year i i, I summed like a pretty good list of colleges uh summer i refined it very slightly but summer was also when i started asking for uh uh i started like yeah i, I wrote draft emails to the teachers i wanted to write my rec letters um i drafted my personal statement then i worked on some of the supplementals because i figured most of them would probably be the same for the coming application cycle um and then i i over the course of like from summer to uh, like early application day, I still changed my supplementals, but you definitely want to start earlier before, especially before senior year starts kicking in and you want to like finish up the rest of your application. So. Okay. All right. Um, any other, Arna, first of all, to you, any other final bits of advice that you want to give uh, seniors who are sort of in the, the throes of this whole process uh, as well as juniors who, you know, next semester want to start thinking about the process. Yeah, for sure. Um, seniors, uh, I would say um, it's really easy at this time to uh, start like feeling inferior compared to like all the people you see doing the applications, like on social media, for example, like, you know, inherently people are just, you're going to start feeling like you want to compare your application to other people. Look, this is this process is about you, and you have to package yourself the best way you can. Um, and and the thing is, like, I'll just pre just pretend like you're a marketer or businessman, right? Um, and this might be easy if you've actually like ran a business before, but like, just pretend you're a marketer, and you need you just need to figure out like no strings attached. What what is what is the best way for uh your uh these admissions officers to really understand you and how much you've done in your community, um. 
that's what you need to do. Like, just, just forget about everything else. Like, you paper on paper, achievements look cool, but you, the colleges really care about um, if you'll contribute to the community, to the to the to the place, to the people, okay. and you need to be able to market yourself that way. Juniors, juniors, uh, you still have time to work on stuff. Um, find a like you should definitely find an action plan now. We as Summit can help you. Um, uh, and uh, just uh, I think now is the time to figure out like what I guess kind of angle you're gonna go into the application process, right? Like, like uh, I guess what spikes you have, what really sets you apart, and what and that thing that sets you apart, can you work on it more so you can finally market it well in your application uh and uh um and just like you know just be cognizant about everything you have to do so you can set yourself up for senior year definitely talk to see your senior friends if you can help them out get some advice from them you know it's, it's you it's it, it is a single person process the college app process but also like like you're almost like all in this together right you all want the best for yourselves or i mean for each other nicely like, the best for each other so okay uh, yeah well, oh, very good advice. I appreciate that. Um, Ashley, for you, the final question in the chat, do students still interview for colleges? Some schools do and some schools don't. Um, I know I keep bringing it back to common data set, but they actually do tell you which schools do conduct interviews. So definitely check that out. Um, UT does not conduct them, um, but you know some will. So definitely something to research on. Okay, all right. Um, Gauri, do you have anything else? Um, I don't have any more questions, but I just want to say I'm so grateful uh, for Ashley, for you to come on and Arnav, thank you so much. I know you were breaking away from a study session or something and um, he, Arnav was also supposed to have a couple of uh, other friends that also got uh, detained in, an, in another kind of study session and something else going on. So they're taking time out of their busy uh, college days and I'm very grateful for that. So thank you, Arnav. Thank you, Ashley, very much. We do appreciate uh, your time today. And thank you, Anu, you did amazing. Oh, well, it was, it was my pleasure and I've learned a lot also. So uh, thank you. All right, thank you everybody. For everyone that's enjoyed um, this evening's conversation, please uh, go to the Carnegie website, cbhspto.org. Make sure you have an account with us so you can get information on any additional events that we do. And we are doing one every week for the next couple of weeks, um, mainly because um, we wanna make sure that we can get as much advice to the seniors that are getting ready to kind of get the applications closed out. I think October, mid-October to November is really kind of when they're in the thick of things. So um, uh, any senior parents here, please make sure you're signed up with us. That way you get a heads up on when the next um, events are coming up. But that's really all I had. Uh, Anu, if you have any closing statements, please go ahead. Just um, to add my thanks to, to Ashley and Arna, both of you for spending this uh, past hour with us and and sharing all of this great advice. It's uh, it's definitely very much appreciated. And I see all the comments in the chat um, and as everybody has expressed their thanks to both of you as well. Thank you for having us. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you all thank for you. your time as well. Someone's asking if these sessions are recorded and they are. Um, if uh, so, we do have a YouTube channel where we post all the recordings. Um, I will be sending it out um, on the WhatsApp WhatsApp chats we have. But again, like I said, if you do have an account with us, you will get an update of when we have the next sessions and when we have recordings coming out. All of that information kind of organically will be sent out to you. Okay. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a really great evening. All right. Have a good night.